Um, today I'm going to talk a bit about time perception because it's one of my research interests uh, and I will start off by telling you just a little bit about the psychophysical methods that I'm using. They're pretty straightforward but just in case um, some of you are not at all familiar with that kind of approach. Uh, and then I'm going to try and talk about three things. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, chronostasis which is uh, an illusion of time perception which I looked at many years ago during my PhD and postdoc, but slightly embarrassingly is probably still the most interesting thing I've done. So um, <laughs> and that's getting to jacked in at the beginning. Uh, also, that's what I'm in it, and I was told there are some high movement people here. Um, and then I'll talk about <coughs> a little bit about interval timing and a little bit about relative timing, uh, so some, some more uh, up to date research. But I might switch the order of those because uh, Wendy told me that you need to take a look at some relative timing stuff today, so I should probably. Uh, get to it first if possible, in case I run out of time, which I probably will. Okay, so uh, we'll kick off with um, methods. Uh, so in the world of timing, there are sort of two different kinds of time perception which we can think about. Uh, the first sort of time perception is interval timing. So the sorts of things that you would associate with explicit interval timing tasks would be uh, foraging. If you're an animal, then you need to know uh, how often you should go back to a particular feeding place because there might be some useful new food there, it might have kind of restored itself for your benefit. Um, or if you're a human forager, you might want to know how long it is before you should turn off the cooker because your egg is boiled. Um, or you might, on a slightly shorter time scale, you might want to know when it is that you should get ready to start going at your favourite traffic light because you don't want to waste too much time there in the morning. So interval timing is really about um, intervals of time, anything that's got an extent from A to B uh, and working out how long that is. Uh, it turns out we've got a sort of fairly good natural indoor time set, so even if I take away your uh, mobile phone, you'll still be able to be quite confidently give me judgments about how long stuff has taken to, to pass. Okay? Um, and then I put another sort of line of stuff there under interval timing, coordinating action, appreciating movements. There's a bunch of stuff which interval timing seems to be an, an implicit part of, uh, which we do all the time, like you know, listening to music, dancing. Uh, inter catching balls, uh, noting when there's that awkward conversational pause, uh, it's, things are getting a bit uncomfortable. All those things are kind of potential interval timing uh, activities. Whether or not it's all part of the same system or not, that's an open question. But um, that's the kind of world of interval timing. Okay, and then the second part of the time, se time section world would be the world of relative timing, which is really um, did stuff happen at the same time, perceived simultaneity, or what happened first? And that, that's the sort, those sorts of functions, which again, we seem to be able to do all right. Um, we generally have a sense of, in, of the order in which things happen. Um, that's, that kind of perception might underlie things like um, our capacity to bind together different multisensory objects. That's, uh, that's assisted by when they are temporarily coincident. Um, so we know that stuff belongs together, uh, useful inference, or uh, we might want to make inference about causality. Uh, what happened first tells us a lot about what caused what. So those sorts of perceptions, those relative time perceptions, can also be informative for sort of useful um, activities, potentially. Um, if I was to be looking at interval timing in the lab, I would want uh, the most boring imaginable task, because that's how we look at everything in the lab. So I would do, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the comparison task. There are other interval timing tasks, but this is the one that um, I'm using in today's research. So an example of the comparison task would be uh, beep, beep, followed by a beep, beep, followed by a question, which of those beeps was longer? Okay, um, and what I'd do is I'd keep the first of those beeps the same length, uh, and I'd vary the length of the second of those beeps. Okay, so um, on some trials, the second beep would be much shorter, on some trials it would be about the same length, on some trials it would be a lot longer. Okay, what would happen is you get a um, pattern of data looking roughly like this, so when the second one is a lot shorter, you wouldn't tend to say it's longer. When it's a lot longer, you will always say it's longer. And when it's roughly the same, you would get some uncertainty in the middle of the graph there. Okay, um, and then I probably want to make sense of all that data and summarise it. So a typical thing to do would be to fit some kind of observer model through it uh, and use that to extract something, some sort of summary measure like um, the point of subjective equality is the standard measure for bias. So that would tell me how long do I need to make the second beep for it to seem the same duration as the first beep to me. Uh, maybe I need to make the second beep 600 milliseconds so it seems the same as a half second first beep because you've got some sort of weird bias. That means that it's pretty likely you do have some, some sort of weird bias, most of us do. Um, if I'm looking at relative timing, I can use similar kinds of approach to get out some useful summary measures. So on the left here 
is data from the task of the temporal order judgment. If you look up to the top right, you'll see my extremely impressive graphic of a temporal order judgment task, which is something like that. Okay, so I'll do that again, and then you will tell me what was what came first, the flash or the beep? Flash. Well, flash, good job. Okay, so <laughs> that was flash beep. So the audio visual SOA was over this end if I'm coding beep as positive. Okay, so you would never say, well, you would always say the sound came the right way around, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay, over this end, okay, if the sound came first, you tend to say the sound came first, so you never say the sound came second. Over this end, the sound comes second, and you tend to say the sound comes second in the middle, we've got uncertainty. Again, you can fit it with some sort of observer model uh, and work out, in this case, maybe something called the point of subjective simultaneity. So when do I have to present the flash and the beep so that you feel as if they come at the same time? And again, that wouldn't necessarily be if I objectively presented them at the same time because you've probably got some kind of weird bias, at least if you're like my observers, you have. Um, and <coughs> the work here is a second task to getting at relative timing. That's called a simultaneity judgment task. So the only difference is the question, which is, were the beep and the flash simultaneous or not? Okay, and when the beep comes a long way before the flash, you say, no, nope, that wasn't simultaneous. In the middle here, you tend to say, yes, that was simultaneous. And when the beep comes a long way after the flash, you no longer say it's simultaneous. Uh, again, same principles apply. I'd probably fit some kind of observer model for it. Um, and then I'd work out what the point of subjective simultaneity is from that model, to the point where the beep and the flash seem like they came at the same time. Can I ask a very quick question? Yeah. Do you tend to get the same bias from those two measures or not? Not exactly. Because that was that was one thing we were wondering when we were reading the paper this morning was why you pick one task rather than like because they were using the sim simultaneity judgment that seems a bit weird to me. Does it seem like a weird task? Yeah, it seems like a weird task because it's subject to criterion effects. And, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a subjective criterion in both. Um, so you, <laughs> there's well, two criteria in the SJ task and there's one in the DOJ task. Yes. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there. Yeah. I don't think there is a. The, the, people find the TOJ task harder. Um, and the estimate of the noise you get from it is larger, probably because uh, okay. it's got additional cognitive operations in terms of ordering the um, the events. Yeah. But I don't really know exactly why that's the case. I don't you have can, so, so you can know that there's an async. There's an asynchrony, but not the direction of it, basically. Yeah. In, yeah. Well, kind of maybe. Yeah, it depends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it's more, to be honest, that in the TOJ task, people just get confused and forget which one's first because there's just more going on there. Right. Okay. Um, there's, there's some additional source of noise in it anyway. Right, right. Um, okay. So, uh, is everyone else fairly clear on the basic tasks? So I'll go on to talk a little bit then about saccadic chronostasis. This was an illusion of time which I looked at many years ago, uh, and for a number of years. Uh, and it was uh, kicked off for an observation of something called the stopped clock illusion, which hopefully some of you will recognise. Uh, might be a room full of black faces, who knows. Uh, if you look over to the, to the schematic on the right, if you look up at her eyes and just use them as a guide, so when she looks at the clock, you can look down at the clock with her. You'll note as she looks at the clock, the clock seems to get stuck. Uh, and then it carries on ticking. That first second after she looks at it, it seems like longer than a second. Um, and a lot of people say they also get this effect, although not as dramatically as this, because I've obviously uh, made it as dramatic as possible for effect. Okay, but a lot of people say, when I glance at my wristwatch, I get this momentary impression it's stuck, and then it carries on going. I get it in stations with big ticking clocks, second hand sometimes. Um, so we wondered why, what might be going on there. Uh, even before we just did any experimentation, we gave it a snazzy name. Stasis. And then we started doing some work. Um, so we, to look at this, we set up um, initially um, an interval task, but in the context of a saccadic eye movement. So um, we got people to look at a um, look at one side of the screen and then make an eye movement over to the other side of the screen to a counter, uh, and then they would make judgments about how long they saw the thing at the far side of the screen. So I'll, I'll flesh that out. Uh, first, I'll show you. <coughs> this video, which is in my day, is it? It's an almost entirely useful, useless video of the schematic because you can't see when my eyes move across to trigger the counter. So the only good thing about having this video in it is that it reminds everybody that I used to have hair at the front of my head. <laughs> <laughs> For my um, personal uh, ego purposes, it's very important. However, 
This schematic is much more useful because it actually tells you what's going on in the task. So ignore that stuff up there for a minute. This is the saccade part of the task. So what happens is a participant has to look to the, on the uh, <coughs> left hand side of the screen on the cross. Then the cross goes grey and that's their cue to move their eyes. So they move their eyes across at that point. As they move their eyes across, schematized over here, um, during that saccade, you can pick up the saccade and we use it to trigger a change in the stimulus. So as they move their eyes across, the, the stimulus turns into a little black square in this particular experiment. Then there's a pause and then there's a second black square. Okay, this is just the interval comparison task. Okay, so this one is always, in this case, half a second. This one varies in duration so we can work out how people's performance is changing. Okay, um, it's very important that because people always have biases in these tasks, we have a control condition. So that's what shows the running down the middle to the right part. Okay, so what we do is we just match the visual stimuli from the saccade condition to a control condition where they don't make any saccade, they just fixate and the pattern of visual stimuli is presented to them. We did the control in various different ways and in our hands didn't make very much difference, but that's the kind of basic principle of the interval task. Okay, we can look at exactly the same question but using a relative time task. So I just uh, bin the stuff at the end there. Okay, so you make a saccade eye movement and as you move, this thing is triggered to change into a square. Um, and at some point around about that time, I play you a beep. Okay, and I ask you, did the beep happen before or after you saw this black square? Okay, so two, two ways of addressing um, the same issue. Okay, um, what does the data look like? Well, the white bars are the control condition, so no saccade. Um, and this is for a standard stimulus of 500 milliseconds. What it's telling you is that the first stimulus had to be presented for 465 milliseconds to seem equal to the second stimulus, which was 500 milliseconds. So what, what the white bar is telling you is there's a baseline bias, it's called a time order error, that you tend to feel the first thing is a bit longer than the second thing. Okay? What I'm interested in is the additional effect of saccade, and that's what's shown in the black bars. Okay? This is for a smallish saccade, this is for a very, very big um, and what you'll notice is that there's a difference. So after a saccade, I only need to present the, the stimulus here for about 400 milliseconds for it to seem equal to 500 milliseconds. So when you saccade and look at something, it's as if it's there for longer than it really is, okay, which is a little bit weird. Okay, and then the other part um, of the study is the, oops, is the temporal order judgment experiment. So this is an exactly analogous experiment, except now they're, they're saying, did the beep happen before or after I saw the black square? So did the beep happen before or after I thought, saw the thing I looked at? Okay, and in the control condition, the beep has to come 30 to 50 milliseconds after a black square appears for you to judge them simultaneous. Okay, that's a fairly standard effect. You usually have to present the auditory thing a little bit later, perhaps because the auditory pathway is shorter, or there are a bunch of other reasons that, might, that bias might exist. But that's the baseline bias. The, the, what happens in the saccade condition is again quite dramatic. So now I have to present a beep well before the black square for you to say to me that happened at the same time as I saw the black square. And you can see it's really quite a, quite a big bias, particularly for the big saccade. It's a, it's a very dramatic difference. You're adding one over 100 milliseconds to when that happens. So you see the thing that you look at for longer and you feel as if you see it earlier than you really did. So the extra duration is coming at the front end of the, of the percent. Okay. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Great, all right. So now uh, the explanation, or the explanation we came up with, which may or may not be the correct explanation. Um, when you make saccadic eye movements, you can't see very much. You might not realize it if you don't study saccadic eye movements, but there's a very easy way to convince yourself, which is to go into the bathroom, look at the mirror, look from one of your eyes to the other, back and forth. What you'll find is you never catch yourself moving your eyes. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Except for when you know you've got. <laughs> no, but I thought. Oh, I got this wrong. But I thought there's some literature showing that if you actually move the stimulus at the same speed as your eyes are moving, then you do see it. So it's not a suppression so much as a blurring. Or... There is there are, there are probably various things going on. Okay, so some some people. Well, there's definitely blurring of high spatial frequencies, mm. which you get if you just move the stimulus. Right. Um, in addition to that, there is probably an active process of suppression. And that mm. happens even if you move the stimulus with the eyes, so that they're... There's, there's, there are... Uh, to be honest, I haven't kept up with this for the past five or so years, but when I last looked at it, uh, there, were, there was some contention, but the majority of the picture was that okay. there, was, there was some suppression. Okay. But, yeah. Certainly, 
there is there, you see less than you would otherwise wear or not there's additional suppression on top or not right. because you definitely do have this component yeah. and you definitely do also have masking by the post image right. so you definitely get less deception yeah. Um, yeah. possibly because of an active process, possibly just because of passive processes. So, some stuff does always get through, right? I remember this one demonstration I was in in a classroom where they um, had a big red light that they were moving and they were asking us to make a skate from left to right and that one really stayed on. I remember that. I think you can sort of get a little bit across. Was it an after image or was it a... It did feel like an after image. Uh, yeah, I don't there was, I mean, this saccadic suppression is about, I forget now actually, I think it's sort of one log unit of suppression or something like that. So, so you might think it, it suppresses, but it can't suppress. It's probably, it's certainly not going to suppress everything. Well, that means something bright. Yeah, that will be compatible with what I saw that you got a little bit of that performance from you. Yeah. Um, <coughs> David Burr would be the person to talk about. Yeah, well, I was thinking that I thought David Burr was the one who did that, the study when you moved over to the island. No, he's, he's, this is his, the saccadic suppression story is, is oh, his story. Oh, that's his baby. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I think the guys who do that some French guys might forget. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, to some extent you see less during your, we'll argue about exactly how much, but to some extent you see less when you're moving your eyes. So the suggestion I'm going to make is that you don't have any sensation of a temporal gap, even though this, the, the saccadic suppression story tells you there ought to be what ought to happen is not that you don't experience your own saccade, you ought to see little dimmings in perception. You ought to see properly and then dim and then properly and then dim and then properly every time you move your eyes. Okay, now also the, the world can jump around in weird ways, which is where reference and afference comes in, which you don't have time to talk about, but there are, there are processes to deal with this. I and mean, one possibility is that chronostasis is dealing with the temporal aspect. It's stitching up your perceptions from a temporal perspective so you don't have experience gaps. So it's like temporal filling in things. It's like you know the schematic, here's your saccadic eye movement, here's what you see at the end of the eye movement. It's like backfilling the period of your eye movement with the image you see at the end of the eye movement. Uh, so it's a little bit like an analogous to the blind spot for the spatial filling in. But steps. is there a bit of forward I mean does it kind of meet in the middle that you have, have forward filling in from the bit that you were just looking at and backward filling in from the bit that you moved your eyes to? I mean, that would make... The size of our effects always suggested that if anything, you backfill to beyond the start of the eye movement. You backfill to about 50 that milliseconds really before the eye movement. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, what, that's, the, that's what the size of our effects suggest. That it cut the your, which is why we... we we our, our suggestion was that you were maybe just using a different signal, like your efference copy signal for the eye movement command, an early signal to make judgments about when the stuff you saw at the end of the eye movement started. Um, right. It's just some kind of. Uh, it's not. It's the best story we come up with. I'm not entirely convinced of the right one. If you have a better story, I'm happy for you to tell me. Yeah. No, it's, no, no <laughs> I just think that it just if you were thinking about building the optimal way to fill in this unknown space, then you would think that the optimal way would be to move it in this way and this way. Yeah. Unless it's something about moving, because the other thing is that when you move your eyes, you answer, I mean, and if the event has already started, like in the clock thing, then there's uncertainty about when the start point was, if that makes sense. So if you like, then think, oh, I'm going to be amazing about this, and I'll presume that on average I've moved in the middle of a time, a te temporal event, then my, my optimal e estimate of the total length of that yeah. is like double what I actually saw. Does that make sense? No, 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 no. I, I don't think there's an optimal explanation for this. Right. I, don't, I don't. So the, the cap may, may well fall down just on that basis. I don't think you can come up with it. And I agree. If you, want, if you wanted to generate an optimal person, it would be more likely to do something like in the middle. Yeah. Um, that doesn't seem to be what's going on in temporal data. Uh, actually, I think the optimal percept would be the, the actual percept, and that you would know <laughs> there were gaps in your vision. It doesn't seem <coughs> sensible to me to, to lie to yourself about the fact that you've got gaps in your vision. But <laughs> <laughs> Some levels of eye movement control and reading uh, often assume that um, as you move your eyes from one location to the next, you continue doing whatever electrical processing you're engaged with up until the point where new visual information kind of reaches the centers in the brain that are doing lots of processing. Right, so like a 50 millisecond 
eye brain lag while you continue processing the word you're, looking, you're attending to up to the point where the new visual information is included to the system. But that's different than what you're suggesting, right? So you're suggesting the same way around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that would be like that would be like filling in from the previous image yeah. to fill in, whereas this is saying yeah. it's the post saccadic image that's yeah. the one that's okay. you know, backfilled or antedated or it seems very counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um answers on a postcard. So, <laughs> uh, for some reason, uh, when you make the reason why well, one of the reasons we suggest this account is because just going back to that HR shape before when you make a small circadian, the effect is small, when you make a big circadian, yeah. the effect is big, yeah. and the amount it grows by is pretty much proportional to the time, the extra time it takes to complete the circadian. So that's, that was what initially motivated us to, to come up with a good to find back in the explanation. And it's consistent with what happens in the terms of the judgment as well. Yeah. But I agree, I can't think of a really good reason why it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that was me pointing that out. So, okay. <laughs> um, I did a lot of work on this and I found lots of other things, but I'm not going to tell you about them today. Uh, so, if you want to know about any of them, then ask me about it over a beer afterwards um, and I'll tell you. Uh, so, what I'll do now is, I was going to go to interval timing, but I shall go to relative timing instead, because uh, that means that if I run out of time, I've covered relative timing. And I think at least one person in this room is marginally interested in relative <laughs> timing, so that seems a strong enough reason to go there. So, Skip to that one. Okay, um, so I've talked about two kinds of timing tasks, uh, interval timing tasks and relative timing tasks. Relative timing tasks being about sort of the perceived order or simultaneity of stuff. Um, <coughs> well, in terms of um, relative timing, the, the classic models come from the late 60s and early 70s and they're basically versions of signal detection theory applied to this particular problem. Um, so, the idea would be that uh, if I want to know the order in which things happen, I've got two largely independent neural pathways, one for, say, sensory modality, one pathway for, for sight, one pathway for audition. Um, the signals are going to travel along the pathways, which will be demonstrated by my nifty little schematic at the bottom here. There they go. Okay, and it might be that um, one pathway is shorter or quicker than the other pathway, so there might be some overall bias in there. Uh, which didn't work that time, which didn't get bias that time, there's bias. Okay, so um, in that case, the auditory pathway is quicker, which will be consistent with that uh, bias I showed you before in the baseline conditions where you have to present a beat after a light typically for them to seem simultaneous. Um, but then the crucial point of these models, like any sort of STT model, is that there is noise in the system. So the form of noise here is latency noise, that's what these little Gaussian distributions are showing. So what it's saying is that on any given trial, there is an average time for a signal to propagate through your brain to some decision center, but that time will vary from trial to trial with a Gaussian profile. Okay, so the time it takes on every trial varies. Um, and that's, case, that's the case for both of the signals, which means that they arrive at this little decision center somewhere in your brain, okay, with a difference in arrival times, uh, delta t, which is also Gaussian distributed if you assume Gaussian noise. Okay, um, and then I've got this guy over here, which is the ever helpful decision homunculus, okay, who sits there, looks down on top of that signal as it arrives, and just decide, makes some judgment about it. So in the case of the temporal order judgment, it would be which one of those got to me first. Okay. And because of the presence of this noise in the system, it's going to be imperfect doing that. Okay, so I'm just going to, this schema just shows the predictions through for simultaneity judgment, because that's the data I'm going to show you today, simultaneity judgment data. Um, so, if we take examples, if I give lots of trials with an objective asynchrony of minus 50 milliseconds, because of that noise in the system, they're going to come through with a range of subjective asynchronies where the homunculus sees them. Okay? And that's going to give this distribution of values here. Okay, now, for the homunculus, if it's a simultaneity judgment task, the simplest thing you can do is draw two lines in the sand and say, if it's above this one and below that one, it's synchronous. So the homunculus, if it gets to me, and it's above minus 100 milliseconds and less than 100 milliseconds, this difference in arrival times, that's simultaneous. He's got to make some decision about where he draws his boundaries. Okay? But what that means is when I present it over and over again at minus 50, okay, a bunch of times that will fall within his simultaneity boundaries. 
Okay, and likewise, if I presented it over and over again at plus 50, a bunch of times it would fall inside the simultaneity boundaries, and that would give rise to the psychometric function over the rotor on the right, which is showing the proportion of times that this observer judges the two signals as synchronous as we go from audio lead through to visual lead. Okay. Um, and that psychometric function is actually a difference of two cumulative Gaussians, okay, which is a, a model based function to fit to these kind of data or you know, a, a irrational one. Lots of people fit a totally arbitrary function, which is a bugbear of mine, but there is, I think it's better to fit a function that reflects a model if you don't fit a function at all, um, even if the model might be a bit wrong. So, um, we work with this particular model and we adjust it slightly because what you often find in simultaneity judgments is that the psychometric function is flatter on one side than on the other. Okay, so here, when sound follows uh, light, it's more difficult in some way to make the judgment than when sound comes before light. Okay, um, there are various ways you can model that, but we, we tend to model it by assuming that these decision criteria are not completely stable. Okay, so they have their own noise. You can't, you can't draw your line in the sand exactly the same from trial to trial to trial. And perhaps it's particularly difficult to hold it in the same place in the kind of sound follows light condition, and less difficult in the light follows sound condition, which would follow somewhat from what we know about the likely internal temporal profiles of those signals, because the visual signal is likely to be more smeared than the auditory signal. Internal memory has uh, a, uh, a lesser degree of, a greater degree of uh, temporal filtering. So that's the model we're going to be thinking about. Okay, and then I'm going to um, apply that and some other modeling in the context of another weird temporal illusion. Okay, so the temporal effect at least. So the temporal effect now is temporal recalibration, which was described by um, these two groups in 2004. Okay, and the way to think about this effect is imagine you go to the cinema. Uh, and the film is out of sync. So they, they haven't synced up the soundtrack to the visual properly. They made the sounds lagging the visuals. Okay, initially, you sit down and you're watching the film, and it's really annoying. Okay, it's like, and then maybe over the course of the film, you begin to adapt to that new temporal relationship and you begin to, you begin to get comfortable with it. And so, in fact, by the end of the film, you're now absolutely fine with that new temporal relationship. So when you come out of the film and you chat to your friend, maybe it looks as if now something weird's going on, like they're out of sync because you've adapted to a whole new reality of what audiovisual in sync is. Okay, that's the strong implication of findings from temporary calibration experiments. They're not usually done with anything as interesting as going and watching a film. They're usually done with things like trains of flashes and beeps. So this is the Fujisaki study. You've got uh, adapters, which are something like flash beep, flash beep, flash beep, flash beep, flash beep. And then you go test stimulus, flash beep, and you say, was that simultaneous or not? Okay, and you do that in different conditions, so you could do it without any adapters in baseline condition, you could do it with adapters where the flashes come before the beeps, or adapters where the flashes come after the beeps, or zero adapters, and the psychometric function seems to move around in response to that. Okay, so uh, after seeing a lot of flash followed by beep, I start to judge flash followed by beep as synchronous, which I didn't before I started the experiment. Okay, uh, and vice versa for flash proceeds. Beep. That's the right way around. Um, okay, so what's going on in temporal recalibration? Well, broadly, at this point, there are three accounts out there. Um, one of them is the latency shift account. Okay, and that's the idea that what recalibration is doing is it's somehow lengthening or shortening one of the two pathways relative to the other one. Okay, now, it's probably not realistic to say in physiological terms it's literally lengthening or shortening the pathway, but you can change transduction times by raising thresholds along a pathway to slow it down or something like that. So, relatively, the idea of that count is relatively one path is, is, being, is, is now becoming quicker relative to the other as a result of adaptation. Okay. Can I ask you a general methodological question? Yeah. So, the study you're talking about up to this point, we're all talking about simultaneous judgments across two different modalities. Yes. Is any of this work done within a single modality? Because it seems like you might get more leverage on actually getting a dish with hard temporal judgments rather than carrying apples and oranges with hard okay. versus visual. So two answers. Firstly, there are some of these kinds of effects in within modality judgments, but they tend to go in, so that there's some Japanese guys who do tactile left-right judgments, for example, they get an opposite form of adaptation, which they argue is a Bayesian recalibration effect. Um, so people do look at it within modalities. The 
The second answer I believe is I tend to avoid looking at within modality cross modal time. In the most obvious case, vision, it's going to depend on your motion detection system. So it's asking a slightly different question. It's asking a question about motion rather than a question about time as such. Um, but that's my personal take on it. But yes, people do look at temporal adjustments within modality as well. You get There's a bunch of stuff on um, color changes versus motion changes, so shouldn't you get some of that? Yeah. Those things. You, you get this kind of recalibration and for color get, and motion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you do get weird temporal devices within, okay. within vision. But, and there are lots of explanations for why. Um, yeah. Well, there's a whole debate there whether it's because you're comparing first and second order chain. Um, okay, so, uh, right, model number one, latency shift. One modality is getting accelerated or decelerated. I thought what they were really saying in that one is that not that you're sort of speeding up or slowing down your process, but you're changing your criterion for when, when an event has happened. Yeah, in, 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 in terms of the model I just showed you, those are the same things, because okay. that model doesn't have any, it doesn't, it's not a full reaction time model which builds a, uh, a sort of evidence accumulation to threshold. Right, okay. It, it's just assuming that in a, there is variability in the timing that okay. these signals actually have for shift. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes. It's, Okay. <laughs> well, just because it starts to sound a bit daft if you say that somehow you've made the neural pathway shorter, like you've changed, why, you've, why would it you've changed the speed of transduction would be a more yeah. accurate description. Yeah. And you can do that through fresh Yeah. Yeah. But at the at the cost of noise, I mean, for certainty or whatever. Right? But I mean, I think in a way, changing the speed of transduction is also quite dumb because it's what the suggestion there is that you've slowed it down in one modality which suggests that most of the time well no is it is, well whatever it, it suggests that most of the time you're, in, in, you're being suboptimal right because well no so but you're not well so 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 the cool finding that sorry is your next point is that if you if if you adapt to the audio visual asynchrony you actually reduce you can actually re, re, reduce re, reaction times to a visual event, which yeah. seemed crazy. Like, yeah. if you could do it faster, why didn't you do it faster previously, right? So, yeah. but I think their argument is that it's about changing the criterion so you don't wait as long to, you know, figure out that you've got, you know, enough signal to say, yep, that happened. Yeah, their argument is exactly that. Yeah. But it still seems dumb. But, I mean, why would you, if you get, if you, if you could do it, because you're going to have more false positives, you're going to you're going well, to respond more often when something hasn't actually happened yet. Uh, yes, but it's not if you're not being punished for it in any way in the context of the experiment. I mean, there is there are optimal settings for the criteria, which it depends on, which depends on the payoffs and costs of the scenario. <coughs> Those things aren't changing. It's dumb to change to just move the <laughs> criteria around. <laughs> um, but, they might, they might, I mean, they might be, there might be good reasons for doing it in the context of changing payoffs and costs. I can't see why you would infer that there should be any change in payoffs and costs from an adaptation situation, but uh, okay. they certainly don't flesh out the details okay. of that. Okay, <laughs> um, okay. so, um, uh, so second account, criterion change account. Okay, so this is basically the idea that the sensory, the sensory level perception isn't changing at all. What's changing is how you choose to categorise things as simultaneous or not. Okay, um, and it's essentially it's like a, it's a, um, uh, I forgot the term for when our subjects do what you want them to do. Uh, and okay, some experimental like effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but by and large, if I if I show you beat flash, beat flash, beat flash, beat flash over and over and again. Sort of by hypnosis, I can imagine that you might come to the conclusion that that's what simultaneous is, particularly if you don't have any very firm anchor before you started about what simultaneous is. Um, so it's about changing the way in which you're categorising simultaneity. It's about you know, it's about drawing one or both of these these dividing lines for what is simultaneous in slightly different places. Um, so that's a kind of high level decision level explanation of what's going on in these. Okay. Um, that doesn't predict a reaction time change, does it? No. 
But you get a reaction time change. Yeah, you could. Uh, it's, it's handy, but you also get things which are inconsistent with the latency account. And you also get things which are inconsistent with. So there's, there's, there's consistent and inconsistent data of all three accounts. Okay. And if you can change your criterion in one task, you can certainly do it in another task. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> in my, I, I think, yeah, there's no, there are inconsistencies across all three accounts. And well, fact, do you, well, they both seem to be criterion shifts, as well, but you're saying that it's a high level criterion shift, and they're saying that it's a low level one, isn't it? Yes, you could, you could uh, put it in, you could put it in those terms, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, so those are both accounts which are uh, sort of in, in the language of the latency model that I described earlier. Okay, you can understand them in terms of that, of that model. The third account which is out there at the moment is a population code model, which is a whole different type of model. So I have to tell you a little bit about that model before I give you some data about it to, to some extent, which is right or wrong. So this is a model proposed by Roach and colleagues, and it's basically in direct analogy to population code accounts in other areas of the visual system. So the classic one would be the uh, way we can orientation in primary vision cortex. Okay, we know you've got lots of neurons, some neurons like this orientation next door, some like this orientation next door, some like this orientation. Okay, and we know that each of those neurons has a tuning curve, so it really likes this orientation, but it likes this one a little bit, and this one a bit less, and likewise this one a little bit, and this one a bit less. You take exactly that same idea, and you dump it on top of relative time. So you say you've got to one neuron who really likes it when auditory and visual stuff arrive at the same time. You've got another neuron who likes a little bit of an auditory delay, another one who likes a bigger auditory delay, another one who likes a really big auditory delay, and the other way. And you get a bank of tuned neurons. It's being shown over here. And that, you're saying that, so that would be something that you would build into your sensory system to help with binding and recalibration? Uh, yeah, or just to... Yes, to, to help with binding, to help with relative order judgments, which might help you in fair causality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so it would be, it's a hypothetical population code because no one's stuck an electrode and found it yet. Um, and it would be in some binaural area. Uh, and the idea is that a stimulus would come in, say here, it would activate this neuron most, but then these nearby ones will also get activated a little bit. So you get a whole population of activity. And that gets decoded again by. Uh, a formalised homunculus who looks on top of it. In this case, the, the homunculus is something called the maximum likelihood decoder. Um, so he sits down, he looks down and interprets that population activity. And what happens in the adaptation situation, supposedly, is that when I present it something here over and over again, the neural unit that's responding to it, his activity gets pushed down, 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 down. He, he gets crunched. Okay, and nearby ones, they get a little bit of depression. Okay, whereas far away ones don't. And the net effect is that if I say now presented a stimulus here, okay, he would get the, his normal, his preferred neural be firing a lot. Just over this side, these guys would still be firing a bit. But over here, these guys wouldn't be firing very much at all because they'd be depressed. So the bias would be that the stimulus now seems pushed over in this direction when the population code is decoded. Okay, that's, that's what the homunculus looking down sees. Um, so, um, just to show you a little bit of data, we did an experiment where we um, formalised each of those three accounts into models, uh, six parameter models, which could be fit simultaneously across four different adaptation conditions. A no adaptation condition, a zero adaptation condition, a negative adaptation, so sound before light, and a positive adaptation condition. And we picked the position of the adapters, we put them in a place which maximises the difference in model predictions for the three different accounts. Okay, so. Basically, the latency shift model says that relative to uh, the time you experience something before adaptation, after adaptation, it gets uniformly pushed down in this case. So before, if before it looked like zero, after it looks like minus 50. If before it looks like 100, after it looks like 50. Whatever I give, it just gets pushed by a constant amount, okay, because one pathway has been sped up or slowed down relative to the other. That's this prediction. This is, and then if you trace that down to the psychometric function, it predicts the entire psychometric function will get pushed across okay, uniformly. In the middle, we've got the criterion change model, and what we've assumed here is that only the criterion on the side of adaptation gets changed. So if I show you light followed by sound over and over and over again, you begin to accept that light followed by sound is simultaneous. It doesn't do anything 
to your decisions on the other side of space, where light comes before sound, that you just leave alone, you've got no reason to play. Okay? So that's just an assumption for the model to keep it nice and simple. But you must know whether that happens from your data, yes, data. from yeah. judging whether things are synchronous or not, you'll know whether that function is wider. Yeah. So it does, is it? Well, I, the reason I started this experiment is because this is what I usually see. Okay. This is what I'm anticipating. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but what I didn't uh, know because I hadn't done the modelling was what would go on in this situation. Because okay. uh, I'm not very clever and I can't work these things out until I do the modelling. <laughs> okay. um, so this is a more complicated situation in the population code because you've got these repulsive after effects. Yeah. So actually, if you take this and you transfer it down to a simpleton edge judgment function, what you find is that in black, the function again moves in the same direction as it did in all of these cases. It does it in a different way. It shrinks in from the side opposite adaptation. Okay, nothing much happens on the side of adaptation. Okay, and if you, the other prediction from the population code model is something should happen for a zero adapter. Okay, because that is adaptation that affects the population code. And the, effect, the net effect of that is to shrink the psychometric function inwards. So it makes a prediction about a zero adapter which yeah. in their simplest form neither of these models do. Right. And it makes a different kind of prediction about directional adapters. Um, and actually, what most people have traditionally done in this literature is just look at point of subjective simultaneity as being the peak of this function. Yeah. And in those terms, all of the models predict what happens, which is that the peak of the function moves in the direction of adaptation. Okay, so unless you drill down into the actual what's going on in the details of the psychometric function, you can't tell if any, if any of the models are more correct than others, at least not with this kind of data. Um, so, uh, I'm going to skip to the uh, results. We did a standard kind of adaptation experiment. And what we found was a little bit mixed. Okay, so, firstly, this is individual level data, and I picked out, so we found participants who appeared to fit all of the three accounts. So, over here, we've got someone who looks like the latency shift model. Okay, the psychometric function doesn't really shift between baseline and zero adaptation. The whole thing moves left of sound first adaptation, the whole thing moves right of sound lag adaptation. In the middle, we've got what I expected to see most of the criterion change prediction, where again nothing much happens from baseline to zero, <coughs> but just one side of the function pulls out for AV adaptation, and the opposite side of the function pulls out for VA adaptation. And then finally we've got an observer over here who looks like the the population code model, for zero adaptation, their function shrinks inwards. For AV adaptation, it's the opposite side which is now pulled in. And likewise, for VA adaptation, the opposite side is pulled in. So we get individuals who appear to fit all of the accounts. At a group level, though, it's quite clear that the population lines are losing. Okay, so if you look at the, if you take these six parameter models, you fit them across the whole set of data, you get uh, you use mean log likelihood as an estimate of the goodness of model fit, which you can do because they've all got the same number of parameters. Okay? Um, you find that the population model fits the worst, significantly the worst. And it doesn't really matter if you play around a bit and try and, I don't know what's happened to those graphs, but anyway, you play around a bit, a bit and try and take out some reasons why that might be the case, which I won't go through in any detail. It's still just always the worst. Okay? Um, so, the conclusion from all of that would be that in this particular data set, the criterion shift change model was the best, but only just. It wasn't significantly better than the latency shift model, and they were both better than the population code model to explain this kind of recalibration. My suspicion is that we need a more complicated model because there's so much heterogeneity in the data that it's suggesting that some observers are doing more complicated things than what any one of the simplified models can capture. My preference is to allow the criteria to change a bit on both sides or to come up with a principal reason for allowing that to happen because that's really what I think this is about. I think it's about reclassifying simultaneity, not about fundamental perceptual change. Okay? But I don't have, from this data, a really strong reason to say, well, why not complicate one of the other models instead and then allow that to do a good job. Um, so at this point, a little bit hand wavy. Um, Time is up, so I will not do the interval timing bit. Uh, so it's a good job I skipped that. I will just go to. Uh, no, that's it, the summary. Uh, time perception is a bit weird. All sorts of strange stuff happens to it, like recalibration effects, adaptation effects, weird stuff when you move your eyes. 
And actually, if you do want to find an experimental effect, if you're struggling at the end of your PhD because your experimental effect hasn't happened and you've got only no effects, just do anything in a time perception task and it will change time perception. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point, there's not a lot of agreement about the basic, the basic models of time perception. I didn't get onto the interval models, which I would have been pooing, but um, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of agreement at this point, um, although there are some ideas about where to kick off from. Uh, and the first one. Uh, if my smallest board of timing is left too cold, don't worry. Uh, judging by the citation counts I get, uh, nobody else cares either. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks very much to all these people who helped a lot in setting that up. Uh, and thanks very much for listening. <laughs>